Let me begin by saying it's good to see and to know that Travis and uh, Brent are back. Um, let's be sure to thank God for his goodness to them and to us, as well as to those who Brent and Travis had the opportunity to serve through their teaching. Good morning. My name is Hunter Bradley. I'm the elder here at Providence Baptist Church, though it's always a possibility that I might be called on to preach. I didn't think I would be preaching this Sunday. Thank you, Brent. Um, but I'm glad to be up here. Glad to be up here. Um, he's been in Nigeria, and as most of you know, uh, he was he, he was he was um, he was a little sick, and. Um, But, um, anyway, so let's begin. Um, if you would, be turning in your Bibles to Luke 22, starting in verse 31. Um, but let me pray as y'all are getting there. Father, um, I want to thank you this morning. I want to thank you for Brent and Travis I want to thank you for allowing them to not only go, but to come back safely. We pray for those brothers and sisters in Nigeria, Lord. We pray that you would use them to spread your gospel, to teach sound doctrine. Um, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just light a fire in that nation for your glory and for your honor. Now, Lord, I, I pray for my sermon. I pray, Lord, that you would use it to speak to this congregation. I pray, Lord, that you would um, where it is deficient. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just just fix it. Um, in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. So if you would, if you have found Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, please stand. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. You may be seated. So let's get some context here. <clears throat> Jesus and the apostles have just finished celebrating the final Passover meal and inaugurated the first Lord's Supper. Jesus named his betrayer and sent him with Satan packing to do the worst betrayal the world has ever known. It will be sealed with a kiss. Jesus then, as Byron preached on last week, had to get in the middle of an ego-driven contest to see who is the greatest among the 11 that remain. Jesus takes the time and points them to himself and says, I am among you. I am the greatest. And I am the one who serves. Pointing to the attitude and the heart that they should have. And us. If they want to be the greatest in his kingdom. He then explains to them that because they have stood by him in his trials. Look at verse 28. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He has promised them a place in his kingdom and thrones in that kingdom to judge the 12 tribes of Israel with him. Judas is not included here. He will be replaced by Matthias. That's Acts 1, 15 through 26. What I find amazing is that, well, knowing my own heart, it's not that amazing, but what I find amazing here 
is that they are about to turn tail and run. They're going to hide, deny Christ by their cowardness. Some, especially Peter, will also deny him with their very words. It is this future abandonment and denial that leads Jesus to speak. And perhaps he chooses Peter because he sees, you know, he's the leader, but also maybe he's the loudest one saying, I'm the greatest. Or, am I not the greatest? For whatever reason, though, he addresses Peter. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, he repeated, repeated his name twice to be sure he had his attention, but also it's probably sad he has to have this conversation. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. It seems that Peter has been in a roller coaster ride in the conversations he has had with Jesus this night. He learned that one of the number would betray Christ. He got corrected for arguing about who is the greatest. He got told he would judge the 12 tribes with Jesus. And now he is told that Satan seeks to destroy him and his fellow apostles. More disheartening is that he's going to turn from Christ. Though Jesus informs him it will be for just a little while, look at verse 32. Jesus says, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. To turn again means you've already turned, right? On a side note, in verse 31, the you there, is plural. And in verse 32, it is singular. So Satan is after them, all the disciples, and all of them do turn away. I think it should be read like this. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you all, that he may sift y'all like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan wanted to sift all the disciples. He wanted to violently shake and completely turn their world upside down. To toss them into the air, scatter them in the wind. And temporarily, he accomplishes that task. In a short time in Gethsemane, he will strike a blow to their shepherd and the sheep will scatter. They will hide in rooms. They will go fishing. They will falter. But it will not be forever. What he meant for evil, God meant for good. The good shepherd will rise. They will be restored and meet Jesus in Galilee. So what keeps them from continuing down the wide path that leads to destruction? Jesus has interceded for them. And in these verses specifically, he has interceded for Peter. Look in verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. If you are saved, then we too can count on Jesus to be our great high priest. Continually interceding for us as he did for Peter. Hebrews 7.25 and the example we see in John 17, 6-19. His prayers are always answered because he always prays in God's will. Well, he is God. The saving faith of Peter and the other apostles was a gift of God. And like Job's faith, Satan's best efforts would not destroy it. 
So how does Peter respond? Look at verse 33. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Let me pause just a second. There are many of you who have been Christians longer than me in this room. And some of you have not been Christians very long. So for those of you who have not been Christians very long, if you would, just listen for a second. In my dealing with my personal sin, the worst thing that I can do is to claim personal victory over it. Or say, I no longer have to worry about that. Or I no longer struggle with that. God, I got this. You will find yourself mired up in it again. I guess the proper answer would be, Lord, thank you for delivering me, but continue to help me in this. Continue to, to carry me through it. Amen? There are sins, young people, that you're not bothered with right now. I used to not ever get angry. Ever. I, it's like a water off a duck's back. And while I am not a raving, angry person, it is now a concern that I have at times. Maybe it's my age. I see all these crazy things going on. Whatever it is, I used to not have to deal with it. Today, I do. I have to continually repent, turn to Christ, ask for help. Help me deal with this. Help me to walk in a manner um, that reflects your love and reflects your grace that has been given to me. So, Peter here saying, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. It's, um, Jesus answers him and says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. MacArthur here says, Satan had been assaulting Peter at least as far back as his foolish attempt to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. Despite having given him the name Peter, Jesus almost always addressed him as Simon, the lone exception being here in verse 34. Since Peter so often acted like his old self, Jesus usually addressed him by his old name, the twofold intensive repetition, Simon, Simon, uh, reveals disappointment and sadness on the Lord's part over his behavior. Unfazed by Jesus' warning, Peter brashly declares, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. His overconfident bravado expressed a sincere love for the Lord but it was based on the assumption that Jesus would be present, as the prepositional phrase, with you, indicates. Since Peter had witnessed firsthand countless examples of Christ's limitless power, he was sure he could withstand anything as long as Jesus was there. That confidence was revealed a few hours later in Gethsemane when he fearlessly took on the force sent to arrest Jesus. Confident in his Lord's power to rescue him, Peter evidently intended to hack his way through the entire detachment, if necessary, beginning with the high priest slave. Shortly afterward, however, away from Christ's presence in the high priest's courtyard, Peter would cringe in cowardly fear and deny his Lord, fulfilling Jesus' warning, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. 
Peter eventually would be imprisoned and later executed. According to tradition, he was crucified upside down because he declared himself unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Despite his denial, under the threat of the events surrounding Jesus' arrest, Peter's faith would not ultimately fail. When he was turned around by divine grace, he would be able to strengthen his brothers. Having been through such an unusual temptation and trial and experienced the enduring character of saving faith, Peter would be able to strengthen and encourage others. He could gratefully tell them that Christ upheld, restored, and commissioned him. Peter would later write his first epistle as a revelation from the Holy Spirit to strengthen others in their trials. His recovery demonstrates the indestructible power of saving faith that God graciously grants to his own. So some observations. First observation is comforting. God and the devil are not equals. As a matter of fact, it seems that the devil is on a leash and God holds it. This does not mean that the devil is powerless or unable to cause great harm. It's just that he has to ask permission to get to God's people. If you will, turn to Job chapter 1. Job 1, starting in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. <clears throat> and the Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The devil does go, and he causes great harm to Job. He takes Job's possessions, his servants, his children, The enemy is powerful. And Satan will come back again after that didn't work. And God will allow him to put great sores all over Job's body. What you see here, though, is God has to allow Satan to go after Job. He has to allow it. And in the verses we are in, it seems that Satan has again asked to be able to go after the disciples, particularly Peter. What is comforting is to know that God, who is good and has told his people that all things work out for the good of those who love him, he is in charge. He holds the reins. So we can say with Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The second thing I see here, well, not just here, but throughout Christ's life, is that victory is not won by easy means. As a matter of fact, Jesus' struggles are so costly and from a human's perspective, heart-wrenching. John Piper does a sermon, and if I remember correctly, it's called Judas Iscariot, The Suicide of Satan and the Salvation of the World. It's a long name. 
In it, Piper makes the point that at first, Satan's plan was to get Jesus to seek victory without struggle. You see that in the wilderness. We've turned these rocks to bread. Don't go hungry. Turn these rocks to bread. You see it as he takes him up onto the high things. If you just bow down and worship me, I give you all this. There's no need for all that the cross and all that. Just, just worship me and I'll give it to you. Then you see Peter say to the question of who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. To which Jesus gives him an attaboy or flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And five minutes later or a verse later, you hear Jesus um, saying that he's going to have to die. And Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, to which Jesus responds with, get away from me, Satan. Jesus' face is pointed straight at the cross. And it seems here that Piper seems to think that Satan's plan changes. It's the same plan, but he knows that Jesus is unmoved and unpersuaded. So it seems Satan says, I'm going to make it as hard as I can make it. Betrayal, abandonment, pain. His victory will be through these things. Just think about what Jesus has told Peter in just the last few verses. He spent three years teaching Judas. He sent him out two by two. Jesus performed miracles in his presence. And Judas is going to betray him. I don't mean he threw you under the bus when you were trying to get that promotion. I don't mean that um, he knew you liked this person and he asked her out or him out before you got the opportunity to. Or even that he turned you in to the police to keep himself out of trouble. I'm talking about that kind of betrayal. A friend of mine, he was in college and he was sitting with these guys at the lunch break and he kind of knew them. And that this guy was talking about the troubles that he was having with his girlfriend and how <clears throat> she wanted flowers, and I don't remember what the other one was. I think it might have been chocolate. I like chocolate, so we'll say chocolate. That she wanted flowers and chocolate, and he wasn't going to get it for her. Well, my friend thought the girl was attractive. So after their conversation and after, college, after his classes, he goes and he knew who the girl was. He went and bought chocolate and flowers and took them to her. He said, I believe you deserve these things, and, um, you know, I'd just like to go out sometime with you. He got a date. I'm not talking about that kind of betrayal. I was crooked, but I'm not talking about that kind of betrayal. Judas and Satan sells our Lord for some silver. He seals it with a kiss. Just think about that. He sells him to be killed in one of the worst ways ever invented. Death by a cross. But first flogging. That betrayal he knows is hours away. He's just sent Judas out the door. Then he watches as his disciples argue the night before you're going, he's going to be flogged and then crucified about who is the greatest. He's going to pray in just a few verses and all of them will fall asleep. 
He's telling Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to abandon me. You're going to leave me to face my accuser. He's sinless. He's healed countless people. He's fed countless people. He created them. And he will be victorious over sin, over Satan, over death, and this fallen world. The victory which he purchased, him alone, he gives to everyone who repents of their sins and places their trust in him. It's not the strength of the faith that saves, it's in who it is placed in. Trust in Jesus, he alone lived a perfect life. He died for the sins of his people and he arose proving that the offering of his life and blood was accepted by God the Father as a payment for sin. This faith and trust in Christ will lead to actions. Baptism. A command for all believers to follow. In it we see that the gospel We see the gospel. As we proclaim that I have been buried with Jesus in his death and raised in newness of life, I have been dead, buried, and raised with Christ. There will be a change in your actions. Repentance is not a one-time thing, but a lifelong turning away from sin and toward God. So I close with this. I ask you this morning, Are you a sinner? Do you trust in Christ? Did he die for you? Jesus is the only perfect person to ever walk this earth. He always did what the Father commanded. Sinless and perfect. If you have never placed your trust in him, then by the help of God and his Holy Spirit, you can today. Repent and believe in Christ and his work on the cross. It's perfect life. It's called the great exchange. It's God's goodness and his righteousness. It's alien to us. It's not ours. It is not your righteousness until it is given to you. He takes your sin, the evil that you've done, the evil that you will do, and he dies with it on the cross. And he gives you his goodness, his righteousness, his perfection. And this is accomplished by faith, and it's a faith that he gives out. Repent and believe. He dies taking our sins. We are reborn, taking his righteousness to be walking in newness of life. Let's pray. Father, I I come before you this morning and I thank you for your son. I thank you that He died for me. I pray, Lord, that if there are those in this congregation that do not know you, that do not um, have accepted you, have not accepted you, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would work on them. The Holy Spirit would take that hard heart and make it alive. I pray, Lord, that you would use your gospel today 
transform lives, and to call people home. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.